Thank you, Linda, and thank you also for um, allowing me to come and present at your at your session, even in fear that I will um, be tearing you apart, which I won't do actually. Um, the session has given me a chance to link together two strands of my own work over the past few years that have become somewhat detached. Um, those relating to ideas of value and it relates to how it relates to the heritage, and an interest in the institutions that govern heritage. Um, lest I be accused of being um, uh, of attacking particular institutions or organisations, that's not what I am doing. What I'm trying to do here is to consider what institutions do when they do their work. And I start from um, the basis uh, of, a, of a comment once made by Michel Foucault, um, and some of you may recognise this as a rather favourite <coughs> quotation of mine, um, that people generally know what they do and they have a good idea why they do it. But what they don't know is what they do does. The same, I think, um, applies to organisations. They know what they are for and what they do. They know how they work. But they don't know, possibly because it really isn't their job to ask, what exactly what they do results in at a larger scale. Um, to take a possible example, the police know that their job is to prevent and combat crime. They know that they do that by acquiring information on, cr on crimes and apprehending criminals. But what policing as a practice also does is define a category of criminal, which it then perpetuates by treat treating certain classes of person in particular ways and demanding resources to deal with them in those ways. It can be argued that criminality is the product of policing, not the other way around. In a similar vein, earlier work of my own has shown how heritage is not protected and preserved because it's valued, but rather that it's valued because it's protected and preserved. This is in fact how British legislation on archaeological heritage works. It first identifies its object, separating it from all the other things in the universe. It allocates it to a particular set of institutional arrangements for its treatment. And as a result, that material acquires particular sets of values appropriate to that manner of treatment. I'm not sure to what extent those involved in the day-to-day -day management of heritage realise the role they play in this. And it can be argued that they don't need to in order to do their job. But if the concern, especially the concern here, is to go beyond established practice, it becomes quite important to know what those practices are. Heritage agencies of all kinds are necessarily bureaucratic bodies. I don't mean this pejoratively. Uh, bureaucracies are particular kinds of institutions that have certain characteristics and work in particular kinds of ways. They are designed to achieve particular kinds of results and do so effectively because of the kinds of institution they are. Peter Berger describes bureaucracies as tools to impose rational controls over the universe. In this respect, bureaucracy is to the social as factory machines are to the material. While factories change raw material into something of practical use, bureaucracies serve to order the social world and make it manageable. They do this through three characteristics all bureaucracies share. The first he calls limited competence. A bureaucracy can only deal with those things with which it is directly concerned. A heritage agency cannot process a claim for social security payments or a tax form. But a job centre can't schedule a prehistoric monument, and nor can the Indian Revenue, even though all represent officials in one way or another. In the same way, bureaucracies subdivide their own organisation so that different aspects of the overall work are undertaken by different sections. The parallel is with processes of factory mass production. It's, of course, highly rational to do this, but that reflects the purpose of the bureaucracy to impose rational controls on an otherwise chaotic universe. The second characteristic Berger recognises is orderliness. Previously agreed sets of criteria are applied in all cases so that things are done the same way. Your conservation principles come in here, perhaps. This reflects Mary Douglas's description <coughs> of how institutions think, which is really about how individual humans make decisions mediated through sets of shared assumptions so that agreement is reached even when there is evidence to the contrary. An example from the world of archaeological heritage management is perhaps Bill Starkin's paper from 1997 on the assessment of field remains, which studied how archaeologists had made scheduling decisions even without clear criteria, and discovered that in large measure they shared similar approaches. 
Um, and basically, the same things would have got scheduled in 1910 as ended up getting scheduled in 1990. And while a very positive thing, it also demonstrates the level of groupthink at work in people with similar training and shared objectives, and that's something of which we're all guilty. The third characteristic is general and autonomous organisability, as he puts it, whereby similar processes are being applied in different sections of the organisation by different individuals. This is exactly what Starting identified in his work, even though he didn't call it that. Different people in different places looking at different things, but nonetheless applying the same kind of approach to reach very similar results. This is the great strength of a bureaucracy, that it can achieve this level of consistency. And that's what we hope from any organisation. System predictability and consistency leading to a general expectation of justice. Because it doesn't matter which individual out of many is doing the work of the organisation and making the decisions, similar results can be expected to be achieved in similar circumstances. This is what Berger calls moralised anonymity, which is the sum and result of all the characteristics of a bureaucracy. And it also serves to protect those individuals, of course, within the bureaucracy from charges of uh, subjectivity or other claims, um, because they're working in the same way as everybody else in the bureaucracy will be doing on the same sorts of things. Um, because it doesn't matter who does what, so long as they follow the accepted rules. So what does this mean for those who work for heritage bodies and this session? We need to consider the purpose of a bureaucracy, to impose order, not to act in accordance with a pre-established order that exists independently. Now, this is not intended as a cop-out for those of us from academe. I'm not saying to historic England and so on, that is your problem to address the issues raised in the session abstract, so get on with it. But I am saying that a clear understanding of the strengths and weaknesses of your position is necessary, and they may not be what you think. That value is a key issue in relation to heritage is widely recognised. Uh, I just feel sorry for the number of trees that have died uh, in, as all the publications on value over the, uh, the past few years to which I've played my part. Um, what I find interesting in all this debate about heritage value, though, is how little of it is devoted to saying what we mean by value. Our discourse of value is in fact highly truncated and collapses to three kinds of arguments. We argue about types of value, cultural vers values versus economic values, or lists of uses to which sites can be put, which are considered more or less relevant or more or less um, useful. They consist about what, it, what is being valued, individual objects or places, broader categories of heritage objects, or the purposes heritage serves, all of which are different kinds of things. And we debate how to measure value, uh, usually, for, for most of us, reduced to descriptions of attributes such as age, rarity, aesthetic quality, condition, and so on. Now, all of these discourses carry with them a whole host of untested and unquestioned assumptions about the nature of value, where it resides, and how it relates to the thing that's valued. They also tend to be rather closed sets of arguments. Lists are exclusive rather than inclusive, and one discourse, for example an economic one, incorporates no element of another, but operates entirely independently. Um, and you will note that people who write about the economic value of heritage publish in one sort of journal, and those of us who write about the cultural value publish quite diff else, uh, quite, you know, in quite different places. So we're not talking to each other, we're actually talking past each other. So instead of reflecting the complexity of value that we all claim to acknowledge, we reduce that complexity to a set of separate issues which sit side by side. This is institutional or bureaucratic thinking in operation at its least useful. While I suspect we all know and recognise that all values are ascribed and none are inherent to any heritage object, site or place, we don't really act upon that knowledge and we allow slippery concepts such as authenticity to slide by us without too much question. The same is true of other concepts which those who call for more flexibility bandy about without too much concern for close examination. Community is one such and the rise of the stakeholder concept is another. A particular bugbear of mine, which relates to all of these, is the failure to engage seriously with issues of ownership. And by this, I don't mean limiting the rights of metal detectorists. I mean an attempt to look seriously at how ideas of property infuse our own thinking 
and limit our capacity to act in relation to others. Even those who argue for the greater public engagement by, and I'm quoting here, helping others to engage with the past to themselves, require that it can only be achieved by use of our own privileged positions to do this. And that's a quote from somebody who I know is dedicated towards broadening the debates on heritage. I mean, it's about the use of our own privileged positions to do this. Note that we need to help here. Our involvement is an actual requirement. Now, this is a claim to ownership of the past, allowing others access to, rem to what remains of our past. And it's one of the many factors impeding our capacity to understand what we do does. Because one of the things that what we do does is to establish, maintain, and authorise particular ways of approaching the complexities of the universe. Underpinning so much of what we engage in is a discourse of problems and their solution. The tone of the abstract of this session, and I make no apologies for criticising it, um, is no different. And I've seen and been involved in uh, conference sessions elsewhere that present issues in exactly the same light. But we work on the principle that first you identify and define the problem, and from that we then work to derive its solution. But mirroring the way that values follows preservation, and not the other way around, this is not the way the world actually works. We see this quite often in marketing campaigns. All those that offer you marketing or delivery or IT solutions, when you didn't even know they were a problem. And the solution, amazingly, is always in the area of expertise of the people offering the solution. In other words, the problem is defined in terms of its solution, not the other way around. This is reflected in the work of Schwartz and Thompson from 1990, whose examination of energy policy making resulted in the realisation that policies are best understood as arguments for ways of life, as rationalisations as rationalizations for different kinds of desired social arrangements. You start with a socially induced predilection that leads you to favor the sort of social arrangements promised by one policy, and having chosen, you then look around for justifications for it. The same can be said of policy in any field. The solution is derived first, and the problem defined to justify that solution. In our case, the solution is a continuing role for experts in heritage employed in various agencies, and I include eight universities here. Therefore, the problem is defined in terms of the way others perceive and act towards the thing in which we are expert, in our case, the archaeological heritage. As the session abstract has it, particular problems are the presence of shifting multiple values, others' claims on heritage, government agendas, and others' detachment from heritage, um, termed disinheritance, which is a nice way of putting it. These are, in fact, not problems, but simply aspects of external reality. Believe it or not, there are people out there who really do not care about archaeology, or heritage, or issues of identity derived from those things. They have no interest or concern for what we do. If we stop doing what we do, it would not concern them in the least. And believe it or not, it's not a crime against humanity to think like that. <laughs> the only people who worry are people like us, because we have an interest in maintaining the particular social arrangements that provide, sorry, that provide us with status and income. People who don't care about the heritage are a problem for us, not because they are a danger to the external universe, but because we cannot solve them. Hence, our concern for redefining heritage, outreach, community engagement, state, stakeholder involvement, and the like. All of these serve our purposes and only our purposes. Maybe what we do does is only to offer us, us as a necessary component of social existence. In short, this session, as so often, isn't about heritage or social inequality or even about the links between theory and practice as planned. It's about making us look important and needed. It seeks solutions to problems that only we define, and lo and behold, those solutions require us to lead on them. As so often, it's an exercise in trying to find a quick fix to issues we find troublesome. Well, there is no quick fix because the problems aren't problems, merely the kinds of things we find in the world. 
My argument is that if we are really to move forward from here, we need to have a clear understanding of our place in the world. That means a solid understanding of what we do does. And to ascertain that requires a solid dose of three combined elements. Honesty, courage and humility. Honesty to look the world in the face and see it as it really is, and us as we are, really are. Courage because we may not like what we see there. And humility to recognise that most, if not all, of the time, it isn't about us. And that's why theorising heritage value is not a Thank you.